Okay, I'll get started. So I'm going to bookend the presentation. Anna did all the hard work here, and she is much more familiar with the gory details of how she did it, which I take to be the focus of this seminar series. But I'm going to provide you a little bit of context for why we did this project and uh, a bit of the assumptions going into it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end in terms of some of the kind of packaging of this work. Uh, it's going to be flipping slides. So when I say next slide, that'll be indication. So next slide, please. Great. Okay. So next slide. Um, so uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about using research methods for ethics. Uh, next slide. So as probably many people here know, I work primarily in bioethics. Uh, bioethics aims at trying to provide medicine or various other people working in the life sciences with ethical advice about what they should do or how they should make decisions. Now, bioethics is by definition an interdisciplinary area. It's not a discipline like sociology or economics, but rather it's an area that draws on a variety of different disciplines or methods to focus on particular problems. There's a wonderful book that sort of describes some of the different kinds of methods that are widely used in medical ethics by Jeremy Sugarman. Next slide. And if you flip through the table of contents, you'll see that uh, some of the kinds of methods that are used include legal analysis, uh, philosophy, philosophical analysis, qualitative methods, ethnography, and whatnot. So if you look through this list, there's nothing in there really about meta research. And I guess one way of describing the work that I do is trying to import some of the kinds of premises and methods of meta research to address ethical questions in the context of doing research. So all research involves, uh, at least a lot of life science research involves experimenting on human beings, or it involves experimenting on non-human animals, uh, both of whom, both of which, whatever it is, have moral status. And so we can use meta research methods to try to kind of ask questions about whether we're really getting good value and whether we have good ethical justification for doing the kind of work we do. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of the kind of ways that you can use meta research methods for ethical problems, uh, there are a lot of different sort of approaches you can use. For example, we've published a paper, the top one there about a drug called imatinib that helped us to uncover different kinds of ethical dynamics that occur at different stages in drug development. Basically what we found there is that risk benefits great early on in drug development and deteriorates later in drug development. So ethical dynamics are one of the ways that you can use meta research. Another way you can use meta research is to calculate numbers that are going to matter. Uh, how many patients does it take to participate in a phase one trial for one patient to have a therapeutic response? In order to do that, you have to use a kind of meta research method. You might use meta analysis, but I prefer to use a different kind of method that is drawn from meta research to, uh, to derive those numbers. Another way that one might use meta research is to increase the visibility of ethical dynamics that people don't talk about. So there's a lot of discussion about how many dollars it takes to develop a drug. There's also a lot of discussion about how many molecules you have to put into drug development to get one approved drug out of that pipeline. None of that really addresses the important question of how many human beings it takes to develop a drug. And so this paper below used meta research methods to try to generate a number in part to just increase the visibility that it's not just dollars or molecules that we put into drug development, it's actually people. Next slide. And the current talk that I'm going to give here, or the, pre the current paper that I'm going to present, or uh, Hannah's going to present, is about using meta research methods to evaluate a research practice. Uh, this, in particular, research practice is called phase two bypass. I'm going to explain that in a minute. And we're using meta research methods to make a determination of whether or not, when this occurs, it's okay, it's ethically benign, or whether it's ethically problematic, or whether maybe even it's an ethically good thing to bypass phase two clinical trials. Next. Okay, so uh, background to study. Hopefully some of you, most of you guys know this already, but it's worth going through it again. Next slide, when you develop a drug, typically it goes through three phases of clinical development. Phase one is aimed at safety. Phase two is aimed at getting preliminary evidence of efficacy. Phase three are those large randomized trials using clinical endpoints that aim at really nailing down that a drug is safe and effective, at which point if it is, regulatory authorities will approve it, and there might be some subsequent phase four clinical trials. So phase two trials are forming a key bridge between those pivotal phase three clinical trials and those safety studies 
uh, that precede them. Next slide, please. Now, uh, during uh, the course of our meta research uh, work, uh, it came to our attention this uh, that it's fairly common for researchers to skip to. So when I had Hannah as a research assistant, within a couple of weeks of her starting here, I put her on a project where we were trying to determine how often phase two studies in this particular series of experiments we did, looking at how well oncologists could predict outcomes of trials, how many of them were preceded by phase two clinical trials. And we wanted to use that to build an algorithm to predict whether or not phase three studies would be positive or not based on whether there was a positive result in phase two. And in doing that, Hannah discovered that a lot of the three studies in this particular experiment were actually not um, preceded by phase two, which really surprised me. And it really was the germ of uh, the project that I'm going to present uh, right now. Next. So, uh, so yeah, okay, that describes that this algorithm that we wanted to create based on whether there was a positive phase two clinical trial. Next. Okay, so uh, so let's get into the sort of nuts and bolts of, uh, of of sort of the premises that went into this study. Uh, is it ethical to bypass phase two or not? Next slide two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next. We went into this with a uh, with a, a set of moral hypotheses, if you will, namely that if you bypass phase two, if you go right from phase one to phase three, that ought to only be done under conditions of clinical equipoise. Now, that's an unfamiliar concept to most of you, but I'll explain briefly what it is. Uh, slide, please. For the sake of this talk, all you need to know is that phase two uh, is that equipoise pertains to uncertainty in the expert community. So if you're testing a new drug under clinical poise, you would always need to test that against standard of care, and you would only test it under conditions where there's genuine uncertainty in the expert community, whether the new drug is better than the standard of care or whether perhaps it might be even worse or the same. So that's really what we mean by clinical equipoise. And our premise, again, going into this is that phase two studies, if phase two bypass is occurring under conditions of clinical equipoise, under morally appropriate conditions, then we should see a preservation of clinical equipoise in phase three clinical trials. Next slide. Uh, now this makes a couple different, oh, and just one thing to say really quickly, um, equipoise is an all things considered judgment. It's not just about efficacy, it's also about safety and ease of administration, all the things a doctor might think about when they administer a drug. That's really important to understand for the hypothesis we went into the study. Next. Okay, so if in fact phase three studies that are not preceded by positive phase two studies, that is bypassed phase, you know, phase three, bypass phase two, phase three studies, if they preserve clinical equipoise, you would predict that the efficacy outcomes in phase three studies that were supported by phase two studies would be similar or indistinguishable than the efficacy outcomes of phase three studies where they bypassed phase two, where they went right from phase one to phase three clinical trials. Next. So that might be the case uh, when, for example, you have a huge benefit in phase one trials and you decide, wow, this benefit is so big, we don't even need to bother with a phase two, we're gonna go right into phase three. Or it might be the case where you have really good molecular knowledge about the properties of the drug, such that you, after safety testing, you can, confidently go right into phase three studies without gathering that preliminary efficacy, evidence of efficacy in phase two. Okay, so that's the first prediction. If in fact phase two bypass is occurring under conditions of the clinical equipoise, you would predict that the risk benefit, the, that the benefit of participating in a phase three study that bypassed phase two would be comparable to the benefit of participating in a phase three study that did not bypass phase two. Okay, next. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, okay. So uh, there's another prediction that one might make, which is that maybe one of the reasons why they skip phase two is because they have a drug that is exceptionally safe, much safer than the standard of care. So they do a phase one study. They're not sure whether it's gonna be effective or not. You would normally do a phase two for that. But what they do know for sure is that the drug seems to be a lot safer than the standard of care. Right? Maybe it's a targeted drug and the standard of care is a chemotherapy, so it's a lot safer. And under those conditions, although there might not be an efficacy advantage for the bypassed phase three studies, you would expect to see greater safety in the phase three studies that were not supported by phase two versus the ones that were supported by a phase two clinical trial. Next slide.
Okay, so in that case, you expect to see greater safety. That's uh, that's the two things we were looking for. Similar efficacy, greater safety for the group of phase three studies that are not supported by phase two. So that's the moral background to what we did and the hypothesis we went into with this. And I'm going to now pass it over to Hannah to describe how we did the study. Hi, everybody. So yes, so I'm going to focus on the making of this project that Dr. Kimmelman just described and some challenges that came up along the way, which I hope are helpful if you're trying to use similar methods. So first I'll run through a quick overview of the methods and then break them down in the slides that follow. So to answer this question of how often phase three trials are initiated without phase two evidence, we performed this non-traditional meta-analysis that relied on clinicaltrials.gov as our main source of data. So for those of you who do not know this, clinicaltrials.gov is a database uh, that all clinical trials with sites in the US or that are intended to change FDA approval um, are required by law to register on and report their results to. And we wanted to use trial records rather than publications um, in this instance, because this requirement for registration diminishes the chance that we will have publication bias against non-positive studies. So once we had our sample of phase three trials, we searched backwards for matched phase two trials to uncover instances of bypassing. And we did this using multiple sources, including phase three trial publications, OVID, clinicaltrials.gov again, and querying um, authors of the phase threes. And each phase three trial was then classified into categories that I'll explain, determined by whether or not they, they bypassed phase two evidence. And we looked at the three outcomes that I have here. These were the three main outcomes we looked at. So the first is prevalence. This is just the percent of trials in our sample that bypassed. And then we also wanted to see if there was any difference in survival and safety between um, trials that bypassed and those that did not. Here we meta-analyzed progression-free survival hazard ratios. This is a surrogate for uh, survival that's commonly used in cancer trials. Um, and to look at the uh, difference in risk for adverse events, we meta-analyzed uh, risk ratios for serious adverse events in the two groups. So overall, this was a complicated question that we set out to answer, and there are many challenges we ran into while trying to design it. I'll spend the next 10 minutes discussing three steps along the way that were especially challenging and which required us to do extensive and iterative piloting. So first we had to figure out how we wanted to build our sample. So we knew we were interested in oncology clinical trials because this is where we first saw bypassing as Jonathan explained. We wanted to really get a good estimate of how common it really was. When we first started, we were thinking we might include clinical trials looking at treatments for both solid tumors and hematological cancers, but found that heme trials often use these different endpoints that would not allow us to pool our data across indications. And we decided to just investigate solid tumors, which generally all use progression-free survival as an endpoint. Um, next, when we started to match our phase three trials to phase two trials, we found that trials completed before 2013 were citing phase two trials that were not easily found on the internet. And in these cases, it appeared that phase three trials were preceded by phase two efficacy evidence um, based off the publications, but they were citing these publications we couldn't find or trials that were started before clinicaltrials.gov was really being used in the way it is now. So we decided to limit our sample to those that were completed during or after 2013, where we were more confident that we would find all phase two trials relevant for the phase three trials in our sample. And finally, when we were developing our exclusion and inclusion criteria, we knew we wanted to populate our sample with phase three trials um, aimed at FDA approval. And this was because we did not want critics to blame bypassing on low quality clinical trials um, or to claim that this wouldn't happen in a high quality trial aimed at approval. And so to do this, we ended up excluding trials, including those that were not randomized or single arm, included healthy volunteers, and those that involved less than 100 patient participants. In addition, we noted that there were many phase th three trials in our pilot that were citing previous phase three trials um, using the same drug and in the same indication. And these trials were often investigating slight variations in an approved indication or drug. Um, but we're no longer very reliant on phase two trials for their design. We ended up needing to exclude these phase three trials that had prior phase three evidence. So once we settled on our sampling criteria, we moved on to matching. I'll first go over this process a little bit for context because it can get a bit complicated. So for each phase three trial, we searched backwards on clinicaltrials.gov 
Ovid using Medline and Embase, and citations within phase three publications to identify relevant and preceding phase two trials. We also queried phase three trial authors when we could not find any previous phase two. So to search clinicaltrials.gov, we use this resource that I want to highlight here. This is called Clinical Trial Viewer, and it was actually uh, made by former BIH postdoc, Dr. Benjamin Carlisle, who did his PhD with Dr. Kimmelman. So using this resource, you can enter the indication. So the indication in this case was prostate cancer, experimental drug was tesquinamod, um, and it will return all registered clinical trials and they will be organized temporally. So here's our phase three trial that was in our sample. And you can see when we did this search, we found another phase two trial that was started and ended clearly before the phase three trial in our sample. So what we would do is save this phase two trial as a potential match and investigate further as I'll describe in the next slide to make sure it actually matched. Again, we wanted to use registration records because in piloting we would find that sometimes phase three trials would not cite this uh, a phase two trial that preceded it if it was non-positive and we really did wanna capture those. Another challenge that came up here was deciding how much earlier we would require the phase two trial um, to start before our phase three trial in order to safely assume that it influenced the design of the phase three. So let's say in this example above, um, if this phase two trial was started in 2010 rather than 2007, there would have been an overlap between the phase two and phase three. In this case, we can't be really sure that the phase three trial uh, trialists had access to the results of the phase two trial before they started. However, we decided through piloting and inquiry with trialists that we would require matched phase two trials to have started a year before the phase three. This time frame was chosen to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and to err on the side of finding fewer cases of phase two bypass than if trials were really required to have fully completed by the time the phase three started. One final thing that came up during piloting is that many phase three trials were citing efficacy analyses from phase one trials um, that had dose expansion cohorts. And we decided to allow these um, trials to match our phase threes um, with what we called phase two like trials. And these were phase ones with umbrella or basket designs or expansion cohorts with efficacy analyses. So once we found potential matches, we dug deeper to see how closely they matched the phase three. <clears throat> so potentially the biggest challenge that came up in developing this project was determining what qualified as a match. There are countless variables that we could use to determine whether a phase three trial was truly influenced by the results of a phase two or ways to say that they're too different from each other to count. Other papers have used similar methods to investigate connections between phase two and phase three trials, but in every instance, they weren't entirely clear about how they matched or simply did not report it. And so our priority at the end of the day was to use a simple definition of phase two bypass that could be easily discerned by a reviewer or a physician involved in the recruitment of a trial. But we still wanted to give leeway to account for ambiguity that accompanies pharmaceutical development. In the end, we chose to use two categories that we could, so that we could provide our readers with options depending on how closely they believed phase two trials should match phase three. So all matches, regardless of type, had to start a year before the phase three trial, as I just explained. They also had to overlap on cancer indication and indicate that the, or investigate the same experimental drug as the phase three in our sample. And once matches passed these criteria, they were categorized as either stringent or broad. So the harder of the two types were what we called stringent matches. A stringent match was defined as using the same disease characteristics for analysis. So this would include histology or biomarker uh, status. They had to use the same intervention, the same dosing. We did allow for leniency here. So I think it was, so it was 50% to 200% range and they had to use the same schedule. Um, in addition, we required that the phase two trials were adequately powered to provide efficacy evidence. We did include a sensitivity analysis here that eliminated this final requirement for powering, and it had no impact on the results. So if one of these criteria was not met, um, the trial became a broad match. And this example on the right shows a broad match that was not stringent because you can see that there's a difference in schedule. The phase two administered the drug every three weeks, and the phase three it did it every two weeks. <clears throat> 
And there were other variables we considered, um, but ended up finding that they were too strict when we were piloting. These include line of treatment or whether or not the um, patients were metastatic. So after we found our matches, we extracted some information from both the phase two and phase three trials in order to complete the meta-analysis. So as Dr. Kimmelman explained, we wondered if one of the reasons that researchers might bypass phase two evidence was because they believed that the intervention intervention was incredibly safe. So in order to investigate this, we needed to extract risk information from the phase three clinical trials. However, there are many ways that researchers will report risk of side effect information in, in publications and in uh, trial results. So one such outcome measuring risk is uh, treatment related adverse events. In this case, someone on the medical team has noted that the side effect is associated with the treatment. And this is the best estimate as to whether treatments um, are uh, indeed safer. However, this information was rarely, rarely reported and when it was, it was not consistent. For example, some pub publications will say that the side effect is likely associated with uh, treatment while others will use different words like possibly, which make it hard to know if you're indeed measuring the same thing. Um, instead, we ended up extracting a different risk outcome that was almost always reported, especially on clinicaltrials.gov, and uh, this is serious adverse events. And this is defined as the number of patients with a side effect causing death uh, that is life-threatening, requires hospitalization, or that causes a disability. I will note one issue that comes up when dealing with registration records is that sometimes it does not, the exact numbers reported there do not completely match the, the publication. Um, in these cases, you should pick one that has priority and extract those numbers when they're available. Um, for us, we prioritize re results in the publication. We also wanted to determine whether the phase two trials that we matched to the phase threes in our sample provided positive evidence that the indication and drug pairing should be brought to phase three. We of course recognize that decisions about a treatment's clinical value hinge on diff many different uh, considerations such as side effects and secondary endpoints. Um, however, by categorizing phase two trials as positive and non-positive, phase two bypass would be more easily discernible by a IRB member or a physician reviewing a trial proposal. So if you've ever extracted information from phase two trials, you'll know that this is uh, sometimes a difficult task as positivity is often defined differently from trial to trial. So we decided for our sake, that a positive phase two trial will be defined as having a primary efficacy outcome, rejecting the null, a pre-specified null hypothesis. Um, or if this wasn't available, we would see if a reported efficacy outcome reached a stated effect size of interest. For example, a single arm study might state that further investigation is warranted if there is a 50% overall, overall response rate. In cases where phase two publications did not provide any information about what they defined as positivity, we did end up taking the author's statements that the trial was positive. Um, so while acknowledging the shortcomings of this last rule, we did not want to falsely inflate our prevalence of bypass just because we were calling these phase two trials non-positive based off maybe research design flaws like not defining their positivity. So once we finalized our methods and figured out how best to overcome these challenges, we pre-registered our protocol and open science framework and uploaded our data after publication. We also reported all protocol deviations in a supplement of our paper. So I'll finish briefly by sharing the results of this project. So in this table, we show that 46% of the trials in our sample bypassed positive phase two evidence. So you can see that 23% of these trials were initiated after a phase two trial that was non-positive on its efficacy endpoint, and the other 23% were initiated without any phase two trial. So this practice is quite common in our sample and is happening almost half the time that phase three trials were started. So these results imply that the trajectory that we were all taught where a phase one trial is run, followed by phase two, and then followed by phase three might not actually align with reality. But what does this mean for patients? So here we meta-analyzed progression-free survival hazard ratios with subgroup contrast between phase three trials that bypassed and those that did not. Um, we did this using both the strict and broad matching criteria. So if you look down here at the broad matching criteria, um, a higher um, uh, PFS hazard ratio indicates worse survival in the group, 
randomized to the experimental arm. So here you can see that the group that bypassed has a hazard ratio of 0 0.86, which is worse than the trial that did not bypass. Um, and this was significant when doing a Cochrane Q-test for subgroup differences. Um, you can see that this trend also holds for strict matching criteria, although it was not significant. Additionally, we wanted to see the, if there was a difference in the risk for adverse events. And here we have a meta-analysis for uh, risk ratio. And here a higher risk ratio indicates a higher chance of having an event. Although there's no real difference or trend here, um, indicating that trials that bypassed were not safer using either matching criteria. So when taken together, you can see that phase two bypass was common and was associated with an erosion of benefit, while it was not any safer for patients involved in these trials. I will now turn it back to Dr. Kimmelman to close the talk, discussing one more challenge that comes with this kind of work. I'll keep this really brief. Um... So great, you know, great overview, uh, Hannah, and I look forward to in the Q&A talking about some of the issues uh, that you raised. I just want to close by saying a couple of things about article placement. It is um, surprisingly difficult to place these kinds of articles in medical journals. Medical journals are uh, unbelievably conservative in terms of the kind of content they publish and the kind of form and structure you would think, at least I, I always think when I go to publish this work, that they're going to be super excited to learn something about the nature of the research that they publish. It's a chance for self-knowledge. Um, but in fact, um, both content as well as methodologically, I find journals often very resistant. And so one really has to be clever and smart and perseverant about trying to place this work if you want to publish this in a high impact venue or a venue that's gonna be read by the kinds of people who are making decisions about the kinds of issues you're studying in this case, case uh, bypass. So I'll just say really quickly, this work was submitted to several high impact cancer journals. It actually went out to review at several, which sort of surprised me, but often, you know, it, it basically got turfed and, you know, at a, at a couple, and uh, it, it was rejected after review uh, at a few of the other places. And some of the kinds of issues that you run into uh, with trying to place this work that you need to think about on the front end in designing it is that, again, reviewers are coming into this not with a meta-research mindset, but with a medicine, a medical research mindset. Just And so when you submit an article like this, what they expect to see is a meta-analysis, and they're going to use the quality criteria you would use for assessing a meta-analysis on your meta-research study. And oftentimes there is a mismatch between what it makes for a quality meta-analysis versus a quality meta-research study. A good example of this is risk of bias. Oftentimes you get dinged because you didn't do a risk of bias assessment, which is what you would expect in a meta-analysis. Meta um, oftentimes it's it's irrelevant to do, meta, to do a risk of bias analysis. It says kind of not really well thought through why they're asking. They're just asking for it because they normally you expect this with a with a meta analysis. Uh, and there are a number of other things we can talk about in the Q&A where often you're trying to sort of weave in and out or in between the kinds of expectations that referees and uh, uh, journal editors have in trying to place this. Next slide. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, we were supposed to present for about a half hour. We're at about a half hour. Uh, so I look forward to entertaining questions uh, along with Hannah about uh, this work and, you know, how we did it and what kinds of challenges we encountered in doing it.